Today on Applied Science, we're going to talk about two unusual materials, dry water and flammable ice cubes. And these are both somewhat joke names, but they're both very real things, and uh, we're going to take a look at the properties today. Let's start with the dry water. This isn't a name that I came up with. If you search the internet for it, you'll find a Wikipedia entry and an entire master's thesis all about this material. So what is it? It's actually a bunch of water droplets that are dispersed in another material that prevents the water droplets from touching each other or touching anything else. So effectively, the whole material is dry because when you touch it or interact with it, you don't get wet. The water doesn't come out. But it's still just a whole bunch of little droplets dispersed. There's a common everyday material that's kind of the inverse of this, and that is whipped cream. So this stuff is great because it is a gas that is dispersed in a liquid, and it creates kind of a, almost a solid sort of material like this because of the gas bubbles that are distributed in there. Uh, but for anyone who's tried to make whipped cream from plain milk, you know it doesn't work at all. The thing that actually allows the gas bubbles to not interact with each other and coalesce into one big gas bubble is the fat that's in here. That's what makes it whipped cream. So in the case of dry water, we need this other material that will prevent all the little droplets of water from interacting with each other. And in this case, that material is hydrophobic fumed silica. So basically just really, really fine sand, like sand dust. And the dust has been treated chemically to make it hydrophobic. I think they coat it with um, PDMS or silicone, basically. So it's super uh, uninterested in interacting with water. Uh, droplets of water will just run off the side of it. And so the, you know, if, if we could somehow get little droplets of water dispersed throughout the powder, we would have this dry water. And so the trick is, how do you do that? And uh, th thankfully, a very easy way of doing it is just putting the two materials in a blender and running it for about two minutes. The silica particles are so fine that the blender is not going to really hurt them any. Like breaking the particles in half isn't really going to happen because they're just so small but the big bunch of water at the bottom of the blender is certainly whipped up by the moving blades. And so every time the blade comes through, it shatters the water droplet into smaller water droplets. And then that gets coated with this hydrophobic dust. And as the blending process goes on, the little droplets get smaller and smaller until they're so small that they're, they won't fall to the bottom anymore. The hydrophobic forces keeping them up into the substance are higher than the uh, gravitational forces trying to pull them out to the bottom. I'll put a little bit of this dry water onto a microscope slide and then load it under very low magnification in the microscope. And you can see that the droplet size after about two minutes of blending in sort of a residential blender like this is on the order of about 100 micron in diameter, something like that. You can see kind of the two giant lines in the background are separated by one millimeter. The ratio that I'm using is about 5% uh, fumed silica to 95% water, but you can try other ratios too. And in fact, by changing the ratio and the blending times, you can actually make other materials that aren't like a dry powder. Like you can actually get sort of like a cream out of it, almost like the whipped cream, uh, depending how big the water droplets are and how much they're allowed to interact with each other, just based on how, um, how many of them there are in the substance relative to the hydrophobic. So the next time someone cracks a joke about dehydrated water, you know, just add water, you can come back with this and say, well, there actually is such a thing as dry water. But then the next question that'll come up is, what is it good for? And if you think about it, it does actually have a very interesting property. Since it's a ton of tiny little water droplets suspended throughout the material, the surface area of the water is tremendous. It's basically like having a cloud of mist that's just constantly in this mist phase. Uh, but then if you want to interact with the surface of it, it's all kind of contained because it's a solid. It's sitting there in a beaker. So we're going to take a look at the next material and then put these two together at the end of the video. Let's talk about these burning ice cubes. This material is known as a gas hydrate, and it is the result of mixing a gas with water and lowering the temperature and raising the pressure until it forms this material that looks like ice and melts like ice, but it's actually a new distinct material called a gas hydrate. Even though these gas hydrates are not studied that much in the laboratory, 
uh, the petroleum industry is very interested in them because at the ocean floor, temperatures are really low and pressures are really high and there's natural gas coming out of the ground. And so it's actually very common to form gas hydrates at the ocean floor. In fact, I think a, a, a good portion of the entire Earth's natural gas is stored as hydrates uh, at the ocean floor. And this was a problem back when the uh, Deepwater Horizon accident as well. We had this oil well spewing methane and crude oil from this broken blowout preventer. And one of the attempts to make a stopgap sort of fix for this was to put a bell jar around it and then pump the oil and gas up to the surface. Uh, the problem with this is that all of that methane produced gas hydrates in the bell jar and actually clogged up all the piping that was in there. Keep in mind that this is not just like a chunk of ice with a bunch of gas bubbles shoved into it. It's actually in a completely new material with its own crystal structure. And lots of gases will make gas hydrates with water. Um, CO2 does, uh, nitrogen I think does, but primarily these flammable gases, methane, propane, and ethane are the ones most studied uh, because those occur naturally in the ground and create these natural hydrates. So in today's video, we're going to use propane to make a hydrate because the pressures required are very low. Uh, the propane molecule is C3H8, so it's a larger molecule than natural gas, which is just CH4 or methane. And um, the pressures required to make a methane hydrate are really high, like 100 atmospheres or something. And just producing that condition is very difficult, of course, in the lab. So with propane, the pressures are very low. It's only about uh, one or two atmospheres and the pressures are just above freezing, a couple degrees C. So the setup that we have here will let us reproduce these necessary conditions. And so we've got a water cooler uh, that I've uh, modified a little bit. I've hot wired the thermal switch in here, so as long as this is getting power, it will run the compressor. And then I've added to it a PID temperature controller that's just configured for on-off control, and it has a really high quality uh, platinum 100 temperature probe uh, dipped in here. And then this controls power to the compressor and the water cooler. I've also got a uh, aquarium recirculation pump in here just to make sure the temperature is uniform inside there. So basically we've got a, a really nice, super well-controlled um, temperature bath here that can go from, oh, I should add that the, the stuff in here is ethylene glycol just so we can go below freezing, no problem. And um, also measuring the temperature with this logger so that I can see the trend over time to see how good the temperature regulation is. The vessel itself I've made from two inch schedule 160 steel pipe fittings. Uh, McMaster has these really cool glass uh, pressure windows or sight glasses. And uh, this is just a coupler. And so the whole thing can thread together and you can make a nice little pressure vessel. And this is rated for up to 500 PSI at 500 degrees F. And I'm pretty sure those ratings are either or. So you can go up to 500 PSI at room temperature or up to 500 F at a reduced pressure, but we're not gonna get anywhere near these limits today, of course. And then to have like a gas fitting into this pressure vessel, I drilled and pipe tapped this hole in the side here and configured it to be up like this so that I could dunk this whole thing down into the chiller and still have gas access. And then if this whole thing is filled up with material, the entry port is still higher, so I don't have to worry about it coming out. I knew that I was gonna want some stirring ability in this uh, compartment too. And so what I was gonna do is take this magnetic stir bar and put it down into the chamber. And since the window is glass, we can stir it magnetically through the bottom window. And so I came up with this pretty much hacked together. Um, it's actually a bilge pump motor, so it's meant to run underwater. And I glued some magnets to the top here and then made this little standoff so that when the whole thing is put together like this, uh, the, the magnet is in the right orientation to drive the stir bar. And it takes a little bit of fiddling to get it right because the whole thing is steel and so the stir bar kind of sticks to the steel and it takes a little bit of fiddling. But once it's put together, it works just fine. I'm using this little disposable propane cylinder as the source of gas today. And I found on Amazon and McMaster too, they actually sell the fittings to convert uh, this disposable propane fitting into a pipe fitting. And then I've converted that to uh, like a refrigeration flare fitting for a convenient hookup. And so 
the high pressure gas comes out of the tank and goes into the regulator and then from the regulator into the red hose and the red hose connects to the pressure chamber. Originally, I thought I would just increase the propane pressure way over necessary, you know, hundreds of PSI, the, the vessel can certainly take it, and then I would uh, produce the hydrate more quickly. Uh, and that may work, but there is a problem with this. Since the vessel is going to be really cold, like about one degree C, uh, the propane vapor pressure is also pretty low. And so if you get it colder than the vapor pressure, the propane will start boiling out or evaporating out of the cylinder here and traveling through the hose and then condensing into a liquid in the vessel, which we don't really want. It would eventually fill this entire thing up with liquid propane. So you basically have to stay below the propane vapor pressure in the vessel here, which is okay because that's still higher than the hydrate forming pressure. Uh, we just have a window where you can't go too low or too high. And as it turns out, uh, the magic number is about 40 psi, about you know two, three atmospheres. And uh, in this experiment, I would start off at about 50 or 60. And then as I lowered the temperature further, I would reduce the pressure a bit. So here's the setup. Basically add around 100 ml of water to the vessel with the stir bar in there, and then seal it up with some uh, Teflon pipe tape, and uh, hook it all up and put it into the um, chamber and just let it cool down to about one degree C or even a little less. I set the thermostat to about 0.3 and it would cycle from 0.3 to one, kind of back and forth. You can see in this time lapse the crystals growing right before your eyes. And it does look like ice, but remember the temperature is always above zero degrees C for this whole formation period. So what you're seeing is not ice, it's actually hydrate, gas hydrate forming. After the hydrate is formed, I'll lower the temperature to about negative five just to make it more stable. Remember that it melts just like ice does, and when it melts, it gives up the gas. So if I want to take a piece out and do an experiment with it, you want to sub-chill it like below its melting point to make sure that you know, you give you a little bit more time. So when you take it out of the vessel, it doesn't just instantly melt and turn to gas. It has kind of a weird look to it. It's kind of like a white candle. Like it feels like it doesn't, it's not cold quite like ice is because it has uh, very different properties and it sort of chips apart. It's, it's just a little weird. Um, and even weirder is it burns and water drips out the bottom at the same time you get this yellow flame coming out the top. It's really quite a nice visual. Okay, so I thought that was pretty cool, but how does dry water fit into all this? Um, in my research, I found out that one of the proposed applications for dry water is a gas storage mechanism. So currently, if you want to transport a lot of propane or natural gas across a large distance, you have to compress it and liquefy it, put it into a tanker, and then you know, ship it or drive it somewhere. Uh, the problem with this is it takes a lot of energy to compress the natural gas and then cool it down to make it into a liquid so that you can transport it. Wouldn't it be nice if there was another material that could sort of soak up all that natural gas into a more concentrated form with less energy? And so some people have been proposing that this dry water would be a great vehicle for it. Uh, so I tried to make some. I put some of our fresh dry water into the vessel and put it into the chiller and ran it through just like uh, liquid water and could not get it to work. So I, I think that um, this may be a negative result, but I probably not. There's some other weird stuff going on. One problem is that the hydrophobic silica is an incredibly good thermal insulator. I mean, it's outstandingly good. And uh, taking a chunk out and trying to burn it like I was doing with the previous chunks of, of hydrate doesn't really work because the the flame front needs to sort of melt a bunch of uh, hydrate that's near there to release more gas, and that's actually what's burning. Remember that solids and liquids don't burn. It's actually the vapor cloud that's around them that burns. So if the material itself is such an amazingly good thermal insulator that it protects itself from its own flame, it won't sustain. Like the, the flame won't continue going because it just the, the heat is gone before it has time to vaporize more gas. I found it a little funny that not only does these, um, <laughs> this, this dry water hydrate not burn, it's actually a fantastic thermal insulator. In fact, it seems almost like a fire retardant in some ways. Maybe that's part of the allure in the transportation because it wouldn't be dangerous if the stuff spilled, whereas if you hadn't liquefied natural gas, as soon as you had a leak, you'd have this you know, tremendous fire hazard. Not really sure, but um, it is an interesting field of research. 
One downside with the hydrate is that it, the water is very heavy. So if you're transporting this by boat or something and you liquefy natural gas, the yield is kind of like 100%. So every pound of natural gas you transport is a pound that comes out the other end. But with the hydrate storage, most of the transportation mass is water. So you have to do the calculations and figure out, well, are we saving so much on the energy, not compressing the gas that the hydrate makes sense? Or maybe the, the shipping weight is too much. And so it ends up being sort of an interesting calculation if it works at all, which I think it does. Okay, well, I hope you found that interesting. See you next time. Bye.